So that kind of tendency for capitalism does imply that it will seep ever deeper into every aspect of our lives until, you know, there is literally nothing left. Hey, what is going on? Welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who studied philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast where we could bullshit with impunity. I'm Austin Hayden-Smith. And I'm Troy Polidori. And this week we have on another guest, Grace Blakely from the think tank IPPR in London, as well as the author of a forthcoming book on financialization, and she is the, an economics writer for New Statesman, and she is all over the British media talking about Brexit and neoliberalism and the problems in the economy. And she is going to talk with us about financialization and talk a little bit about like the Green New Deal and left strategies for mitigating the contradictions of capitalism, etc., 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 etc. Troy, did you ever watch uh, the film The Ten Commandments with Yul Brenner? No, I don't think so. Oh, he's got this famous way that he says, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I would, listen, I would listen to Yul Brenner say anything. He's, I fucking love me some Yul Brenner, man. Is, King and I. Is that why you're going, you're going close to bald, dude, on purpose? To be like Yul Brenner? Yeah, dude. That's it, man. I, I, I mean, biologically, and then I just take a razor to the head because I want to be like a white Yule. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then it's summertime here right now in Australia, so I'm going to get a tan as fuck, and then I'm going <laughs> to be like a, a tan white Yule. Uh, all right, so before we get into the episode, we want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor over at Mubi. That's M-U-B-I. If you go to Mubi.com slash Owls at Dawn, you will get a free 30-day trial. Mubi is a streaming service. Every day they present a new film, timeless classics, thought-provoking documentaries, acclaimed masterpieces, regional specialties, all kinds of good shit. There are always 30 perfectly curated films that are on Mubi. Basically the way that it works is a new film comes on each day, it lasts for 30 days, and then of course at the end of that 30-day rotation it drops off. And uh, you get this constant fresh rotation of 30 perfectly curated films. It's fucking amazing. Troy has a film that he wants to talk to you about. He wants to talk about Winter's Bone that is on the American market. Now, remember, I'm in Australia, so I have a different market. So I'll tell you about a film that I dig on my market. But in his uh, in his market in America, you got Winter's Bone, yeah? Yeah, one of the recent films that was uploaded is uh, or available is Winter's Bone. And uh, if you haven't seen Winter's Bone, you probably are at least aware of it in that it was the film that – Back in 2010, I believe, launched Jennifer Lawrence's uh, acting career and made her a, a phenom. Um, but it's so much more than just a display for a young, talented actress. It's a fantastic film. Probably one of my favorite feel-bad films um, ever. I don't know Ooh. if you can really watch this more than once. But when you do watch it, it's it's one of those just utterly captivating films. Um, mm. The director, uh, Deborah Granick, is the director who... Um, did one of my favorite movies last year, Leave No Trace. Um, so if you were maybe aware of that or watched that after our recommendation, um, Winter's Bone is definitely much more of a feel-bad film than Leave No Trace, but it has similar explorations of family drama and and uh, mm. kind of quiet heroism and things like that that um, I really, really love. And certainly it's a kind of drama that you don't see too often in terms of it's it's the depth of human emotion and suffering and um it's 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 a fantastic film and i'd encourage anybody um to get on movie tonight and uh, dedicate your evening to some winter's bone and if you're elsewhere in the world and you don't have that film in your library sometimes the way they do it too is that like it'll be in one library and then it'll go to a different regional library so like you had valhalla rising in yours a couple weeks ago Mm -hmm. or whatever it was i have it in mine now so, like, uh, I think, I, I don't know how they how they select it exactly, but, like, it's in mine now, so you can check that one out. But the film I wanted to mention, I haven't actually seen it, but I really love the uh, director. Uh, her name's Kelly Reichardt, but the film is called Meek's Cutoff. Have you heard of this film? I haven't. 
So it stars Michelle Williams, and then um, like Zoe Kazan is in it, Paul Dano is in it, and then other people that you would recognize, like Will Patton and Bruce Greenwood. You'd recognize their faces if you don't know their names. But it's uh, it's like a western about these settlers uh, who are caught in a dangerous situation as they're traveling across, I think, like the West in the 1840s in the United States. But Kelly Reichardt is a, a screenwriter and director who's known for like it's called like neo neo realism so it's super gritty and super like reality based and i had completely forgotten about this film and then just randomly last night i was looking on the movie library and i was like oh fuck meek's cutoff is on there but i was not in a state of mind to watch like this intense fucking western drama where i i don't know like they're gonna die of diphtheria or whatever the fuck people died from back then so i was like uh, i will watch it tomorrow but yeah so that's going on right now. So that's the kind of film options that you get on Mubi. So go to Mubi.com slash Owls at Dawn and get your free 30-day trial. Again, that's Mubi, M-U-B-I dot com slash Owls at Dawn. I definitely want to watch uh, a vision of myself in the Old West with Paul Dano. So I'm definitely going to have to watch that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You are Paul Dano. Uh, and also, if you want to support us, you can always go to patreon.com slash owls at dawn. We have several different options for you to contribute and um, donate, and you'll receive various rewards based upon your donation. We develop a newsletter every month, which will we'll have a new one coming out in the next uh, week, week and a half or so. Um, we also have uh, occasionally patron-sponsored or patron-decided uh, episode topics that we'll do. We'll have one of those coming up in the next couple of weeks as, as well. Um, and also bonus episodes, which we do uh, a few times a month that uh, you'll have access to by being a patron supporter. So make sure you go to patreon.com slash owls at dawn for access to all of those things. The patron topic is going to be next week, isn't it? The art and artist, problematic artists? Yeah, I believe that's what we've planned. Oh, sweet. Okay, cool, man. Cool, cool, cool. And dude, uh, we have a new iTunes review with a question that we need to read. So uh, this iTunes review is from Gunner's Formula, and uh, he or she says, The Peter Rollins episode is my personal favorite. Austin and Troy have great chemistry and have an ocean of knowledge. I guess that means that our knowledge is full of uh, abandoned plastics and oil spills. Yeah, I was going to say like fish piss and shit. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense actually. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Each episode has a lot to chew on. Question, what are your thoughts on free will? That is compatibilism, determinism, and libertarian free will. Never heard your thoughts on that. Uh, so I think the first thing I direct uh, Gunner's formula to is that we have an episode on free will actually from way back in our backlog um, called, it was like a free will means not being a dick, I believe is the title, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So definitely right. go back and listen to that. But I think we can maybe give like a, a really short, brief uh, bit of thoughts on compatibilism, determinism, and libertarian free will, you think? Yeah, I think so. Um, so, w- do you yeah, have like you a, an abstract on that? Um, I mean, I'll make I'll make a statement. Uh, I think the 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 way that I'm thinking through the issue of freedom versus determinism now is freedom within conditions that are not of your own choosing. So, freedom is the ability to transform the material conditions, and the material conditions don't just mean that I can like lift up my bed or I can like raise my arm. But it means uh, also the relations between things can be transformed. You know, I can, uh, I can transform the words that I'm using. Like, I can select to use a word right now. However, I can only select that word, or going back to the more kind of simple answers, I can only lift up my bed from within conditions that I have not chosen. So I am thrown into a material environment that imposes restrictions upon me. I can only say words within certain parameters. There are certain things that I cannot do, things that I might not even know that I'm not able to do with words because they're outside of my purview. But I do know that I can say the word pig when I'm trying to articulate this experience of what animal is it that makes bacon or whatever, right? But nevertheless, I'm still working within a symbolic system that equips me with limited parameters that allow me to be able to say the word pig when referring to the animal that makes bacon. And there's this really complex system that is impinging upon me. But nevertheless, I'm still able to transform uh, the parameters that are restricted upon me in certain ways in my articulation of ideas and thoughts. 
And it, the same goes for lifting my arm and raising my bed. There are parameters that are imposed upon me, but nevertheless, I'm able to work within those parameters to transform them. And that is what I understand as my conception of freedom now. It's freedom within conditions that are not of your own choosing. That's a very Star Train response, is it not? Well, what can I do, man? That's my thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I've been yeah, too I'll influenced, just really quickly, you know? <laughs> I'll just really quickly add to that. You know, I, I come at this question from the point of view of ethics and moral responsibility. Um, in that, I think natural science sort of has to assume that determinism is true in order to function. Right? It's a methodological assumption and a necessary one. And I think that's that's definitely fine. Right? That's just kind of how natural science has to work. Um, I think that it is also true that um, from the from the point of view of ethics, we also kind of have a have to have a methodological assumption of some sort of freedom. Um, what kind of freedom that is is up for debate, but it needs to exist at least in the sense that uh, we can't even talk about the notions of uh, deliberation, choice, and responsibility unless there is unless determinism is sort of in some way rejected. So mm. there's this weird kind of parallax where. We have to kind of assume determinism is true in some cases and assume it's not in other cases. Uh, and that is very difficult to hold in your mind at the same time because that seems contradictory. Um, but I think that for the time being, we kind of have to live within that parallax. Uh, I don't think either option, either sort of assuming determinism is true tout court or assuming that free will is absolutely the case is coherent um for reasons that i won't get into here because there's a little bit too much to unpack there um yeah. but i think we do have to accept that uh that tension at least for now has to be the case and i i do think that there's some sense in which maybe when we understand a little bit more about the nature of the physical world that tension might go away mm -hmm. um but yeah, it's not a, it's not a, a like a necessarily a satisfying answer, um, but hey, philosophy is about unsatisfying answers, so I'm actually kind of okay with that, and it means opportunity for more thinking, um, mm. rather than just sort of uh, an answer which sort of dismisses the problem and hand waves it, which is often what happens in this debate. Yeah, Man, most debates too, you know, the, the people get to the difficult points in they hunker down in what's comfortable and i'm just like no that that that's the point where you don't stop like that's the point where you start <laughs> you know like that's it um yeah it's and it's an interesting one man so but i like it the reason why philosophers still get employed rarely but they still get employed <laughs> hire me we'll work for creation of concepts <laughs> <laughs> But you know what we got to do before all that, dude? What do we got to do? The Shitty Minute. The Shitty Minute is where one of us rants and raves about whatever it is that's grinding our gears this week. And Austin, the torch is yours. So what's pissing you off this week? Yeah, man. So I got two things. I feel like I do this. I got two and I don't know what I'm going to talk about. And then I kind of just flip a coin in my mind. Um, all right. I'm going to talk about the State of the Union address. Oh. So... Here's my deal, man. Uh, I did not watch the State of the Union Address. Uh, I have forced myself in the past to watch State of the Union Addresses, but that's only because I felt like it was some sort of duty. One, as like a citizen, and two, as a commentator on culture and politics and society at large, I felt like I had some sort of ethical responsibility to be informed but I'll be completely honest, it is such a load of bullshit, <laughs> and especially when you have a guy that cannot speak about anything substantively, all it ends up being is just empty platitudes just thrown out. And I think, I think it was AOC that actually said it. She's like, I didn't know if he was trying to actually talk to the nation and address them or if we were on the campaign trail. And here's the thing. Yeah, obviously Trump is a buffoon, and he obviously is inarticulate, and he doesn't give a shit about 
like the socio-political framework of the United States. Like that's just not something, that's just not in his makeup. So we know that he's not going to give some sort of substantial State of the Union. But no president is really going to give a substantial State of the Union because it's all fucking political pageantry. And the fact that people get so fucking worked up and they want to like tweet about it for hours and then write think pieces. And I mean, the amount of fucking articles that I saw written bemoaning the State of the Union address, I was like, guys, what the fuck else do you expect? And it made me just think that there is just negative affect swirling around American politics right now. So much so that anything that is done has to be commented on in a negative way because it's some sort of like uh, reversal and projection of our own anxieties onto the thing so that we can then have it redoubled back onto us as we realize that we are better than that or we are not that. And there's this weird sort of like perverse narcissism that I feel like takes place when so many people are just engaging in this critique. And I actually tweeted about it the other day and I was like – and I'm not talking about people who are like my friends on Twitter who are commenting because pe- people that I'm friends with on Twitter are like – they're like actually political theorists or they're actually political commentators or social commentators and they have depth in their analysis. So I'm not just talking about anybody who criticizes the State of the Union, but I'm talking about the people who make their living day to day just commenting on political dramas like, did you hear what Chuck Schumer said to Nancy Pelosi and blah, 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 and did you hear what this blah, 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 and this senator did this, and they're just caught up in these political dramas, and then they get so caught up in the political pageantry while not criticizing it and saying, hey, let's like criticize this substantively and talk about how this particular event demonstrates how vacuous the American political system is and here are ways that we can kind of supersede that. But I'm just talking about the people that just like to just bitch like it's high school drama and that's all it reminds me. And I was like, you basically are just theater critics. And then I felt really bad and I felt really bad about my my, my snarky tweet. And the reason I felt bad was because I was unfair to theater critics because these motherfuckers <laughs> are worse than theater critics. They are not theater critics. They're pageant judges. That's what they are. It's like watching Donald Trump's bullshit Miss America, Miss USA, whatever the fuck thing it is that he does. And it's one of those judges that is judging someone because they twirled a baton or gave some prefabricated speech about world peace or some bullshit like that. That's what these motherfuckers are. Theater critics at least engage with art and they can talk about some sort of like cultural relevance as it's being reflected, as society is being reflected back to us on stage. But these motherfuckers, they're just like pageant judges. That's what they are. And it's so fucking ridiculous, man. Guys, adjust your expectations. If your expectations are that you're going to somehow find something substantial in the fucking State of the Union address, then you need to poke yourself in the goddamn eye because you're not going to. Go watch the Firefest documentary. End scene. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, dude. I, I, I don't know if I've ever agreed with a shitty minute of yours more. I felt the exact same way. Although I think I avoided all of the uh, post pageantry analysis as much as I did the actual uh, State of the Union address itself. Um, you know, the worst thing I can imagine is hmm. um, uh, my girlfriend, she was telling me she was, you know, avoiding it and doing something else during the State of the Union. But then she was in an Uber um oh, to no. come home afterwards and the dude who was driving the uber was playing it on the radio the whole way and i was like oh, no. is there anything wor-? that's like basically getting drive by shot on right like you're avoiding yeah, see, this listen. horrible thing and then it, it comes <laughs> at you in a way and you can't really tell the person please turn that off right yeah like you could if it was like you know some music you don't like or if it was the eagles and you're like i hate the fucking eagles at least you're recording the big lebowski so you know you're doing something in, like intelligent there yeah i mean you're yeah. you're, you're screwed at that point yeah, I was walking. I was walking after I was doing some work at a cafe today, and a pigeon shat right next to my foot. And I feel like if it had hit me, that would be the best metaphor for what happened to <laughs> your girl. Yeah, dude. A pigeon shat on her. Uh, a, a state of the union pigeon just dropped a <laughs> load on her shoulder. Yeah, dude. I mean, I, I and I wholeheartedly agree with your psychoanalytic take on the whole thing too. I'm, I'm not huge into giving psychoanalytic takes on everything, and I think sometimes that can be you know, overdone but it's 100 it's nothing could be more obvious than the idea that this is a kind of like uh exercise narcissism um the 100%. desire to even engage with this thing there has to be some discernment about things that are important when it comes to politics <laughs> yes. and things that are clearly utterly lacking in any relevance or importance to anybody's life and the state of the union address is the it's the urtext of the unimportant political event. 
So yes, you. I mean, if you want to get engaged with it because you want to do whatever you want, but there's nothing you can that you can gain from it. We we learn nothing and only commit ourselves to suffering by yeah, that's it. Paying attention to it, just neg- negative sentiment. That's what you're going to get from it. Yeah, the perverse um, pleasure of negative sentiment. That's it. That's exactly it, man. And and I think and this this almost isn't like a personal indictment against people who make their living doing this type of like popular political pageantry. But commentary. you should still quit. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> but you should oh, still yeah, you quit. Still quit. Get a life. <laughs> yes, yes. You have the responsibility to quit, but I'm not going to indict you for being caught up in it because I think there is like a real sort of habitual and structural attachment that it's almost it's almost an unconscious ideological. And I don't mean ideological in the popular sense, but I mean this in like the literal sort of psychoanalytic sense. It is the you don't know that you're doing it, but you do it sort of thing. I think so many people are so caught up in it. Or maybe, I mean, Zizek's new thing is that it's basically fetishistic disavowal. You know exactly what you're doing, you know, cognitive dissonance. You know that you're doing it, but you do it anyway. Um, it could be that too. Like you know that all this is bullshit, but yet you kind of suppress that and you engage in it anyway. It could be that, or it could be kind of a combination of the two where you don't know that you're doing it but you do it like i don't know to what degree that awareness manifests in and i'm sure it varies uh based on the person or the context or whatever but nevertheless man it's like people are caught up in this weird tide and i feel like with the trump election in particular the tide and the amount of people that are swept up in this perverse pleasure of negative sentiment is only magnified to like the hilt. And it's really, it's really strange. And even, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people get caught up in it that I previously really respected. And I'm kind of like, God, like journalists that I thought were like people that were really like substantial. I'm like, dude, like what the fuck is going on here? I, I can't like unsubscribe, not get out of my feed, you know? So that's my shitty minute, man. All right, sweet. So now we're going to jump into our main segment this week. And this week we are blessed to have the, I don't know, the what, scatterbrain, polymath. You kind of are doing a little <laughs> bit of everything. What, what is it, Grace? IPPR, you're a book writer. You are now like a, a media semi-celeb. I don't think there's anybody ever in the history in the world that has written an economics report and then has all of a sudden become like semi-famous. Like, are you the first person ever, Grace? I mean, I don't know about that. Maybe also like Marx and Keynes. I'm obviously not comparing myself to Marx and Keynes, by the way. That's good company. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like the I like being called scatterbrain. That was fun. Um, yeah, well, it's a term of endearment. I usually use it to apply to myself, so I figure uh, I can share the moniker. But it's Grace it. Blakely uh, on the podcast, so say hello, Grace. Hi, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on. So you are a research fellow at IPPR in London, Oxford. Where is it? In London, yeah. So I'm uh, I'm a research fellow here working on the economy team. I'm also the economics correspondent for the New Statesman. Uh, and I am trying to finish my book at the same time as doing all of those things, which is very difficult. <laughs> awesome. And so, I mean, you issued a report. It was called On, uh, on, on Borrowed, Borrowed Time. Time. Yeah, yeah. That's and is a- your book... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, that was just one of a couple of, um, of reports I did last year because we've been working on this thing called the Commission on Economic Justice at IPR, which is like a two-year-long program looking at all the kind of problems with the British economy. And I did a couple of different papers on that. So a couple on taxation, um, that big one on the kind of exchange rate and, and the finance sector. Um, okay. So, yeah. And is your book sort of expanding on some of the stuff that you were working on in that report? Yeah, it's linked. Um, So the report basically looked at um, the UK's relationship with the rest of the world uh, and how that is influenced by our finance sector. Um, So, I mean, our big problem internationally is that we've got this big current account deficit. Um, And I was basically looking into why that's the case. And essentially, uh, I concluded that it was to do with capital inflows into our finance sector and into um, real estate and other assets that have driven up the value of our currency and made our exports uncompetitive. Um, and so that kind of led me into looking at, a bit into financialization and, and what that's meant for the UK growth model. And then my book is basically an economic history of, of financialization in the UK, along with kind of what we can do about it. 
Okay. And then you've also been going all over in the media talking about like <laughs> Brexit and the <laughs> negotiations and the potential consequences of whether there's a good deal or a no deal or a bad deal or whatever, right? Yeah. So you're kind of in the forefront of those discussions as well. Yeah. So I've been doing a lot of media, I guess, because... Uh, well, I think, you know, as now I'm like a journalist, kind of, uh, working at the New Statesman, they often, you know, journalists often kind of go on the TV and on our political talk shows and do analysis and stuff. And I suppose as like a young female socialist, I am something of a novelty. So <laughs> they've kind of brought me on a, a couple of different shows now. Um, and yeah, are you, are you literally a communist with Ash, uh, it was, do I you would, have one of those shirts? <laughs> I don't have, and I'm literally a communist shirt. I'm going to go with I'm a democratic socialist. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Good, good. <laughs> um, so I guess, uh, you know, our our podcast is primarily, I guess we would say it's like a philosophy, culture, critical theory, um, politics, and then we touch on some political economy. But Amazing. We're, we're more kind of comfortable in the space of the theoretical. So I thought okay. it would be really nice to have you on to come on to kind of take our heads out of the clouds a little bit and ground us a little bit. Um, you know, so Troy and I can talk about... <laughs> yeah. so, like, I usually so, am like the opposite in like the circles I'm mixing in, so I love this. <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, it'll yeah. be like maybe a nice synthesis then. <laughs> yeah. But like Troy and I can talk a lot about neoliberalism from, you know, a cultural, philosophical, uh, conceptual and theoretical standpoint. But it'd be really nice to talk about like what is this fucking term that people mm. throw around all the time, neoliberalism, and how does it relate to financialization? Does it relate? And obviously, since you talk nonstop about these terms, I figured it'd be wonderful to kind of get a primer, especially for maybe our listeners who aren't as versed in economic language, which is a completely different world. I mean, you kind of have to learn mm. a completely different language in order no, to speak right. it. So yeah. could we just start with like, what what is financialization? Very good question. Um, so financialization has several different definitions. It depends what kind of perspective you're looking at it from. Um, but from a kind of Marxist slash post Keynesian perspective, it's kind of the increasing importance of financial institutions. So that's banks as well as uh, non-bank financial institutions like asset managers, hedge funds, um, uh, kind of the shadow banking system, all these different sorts of things in the operation of um, of the economy. So that isn't just, you know, financial activities, uh, you know, in and of themselves. It's also the rise of um, the financialization of the corporation, for example. So of shareholder value orientation within corporations, which essentially means um, that those businesses being run in the interests of shareholders, their owners, um, rather than uh, other stakeholders. And, uh, mm. you know, when it comes to households, for example, it's, it's to do with the, the financialization of the household. So rising corporate debt, um, rising kind of asset ownership, integration into financial markets, all these different sorts of things. So it's kind of this really expansive term that encompasses the kind of ep economic, political and sociological implications of um, the increasing size of, uh, of the finance sector and its increasing dominance over other aspects of economic life. Okay. So... How does financialization come? So now, like, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit read in this world. And so I know that there are various theories. You know, you've got the monthly review school within the yeah. Marxist community that talks about monopoly capitalism. Mm -hmm. You obviously have Hilferding and finance yeah. capital. You have Greta Krippner, who's really famous and kind of popularizing the idea of financialization. It yeah. sounds like you kind of would kind of like synthesize kind of those types of things and maybe follow Krippner and like, post-Keynesian ideas about maybe what, like productivity slows down in the real economy or in manufacturing, and so capital needs to find a place to become profitable, so it uses the Volcker shocks, you know, where interest mm. rates are crazy high as like a perfect uh, launch pad for getting a high return on its investment, and then so it turns into the, the financial sphere. Is that kind of what you would say is the, the narrative? Um, kind of. I mean, you're right. There are so many different ways of looking at this. I don't really think... It's, you know, it's not, there, there's similarities and there's differences. And, you know, when you talk about, particularly when you talk about crisis theory, um, every, so, you know, ideas about the, the inherent tendencies of, of capitalism towards crises and inherent contradictions, um, which, you know, this financialization school is obviously based on, on that reading of history. Um, then there's so many different interpretations of what that means and how that comes about. And you've mentioned a couple, there are, there are many more as well. But, you know, I don't think yeah. that the, 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 there's, 
there's a lot of agreement as well as to what this uh, phenomenon looks like, what it is and, and how its history um, developed. And I, I kind of have my own ideas, as you said, which which are based on um, a reading of a lot of these different authors and, and a kind of attempt to bring a lot of their ideas together. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the dominant theories about this, you mentioned Hilferding, monopoly capitalism. There is this idea that... Um, uh, as capitalism develops and as uh, corporate monopolies gain ever kind of higher levels of profit, they become more um, involved with the finance sector uh, in order to um, reinvest those profits. And that those kind of large pools of capital that emerge um, at the kind of, well, eventually at the international level as a result of these rising corporate profits are for Lenin, a very important aspect of imperialism because obviously they need to go somewhere to find returns. Lower returns in those advanced economies mean they kind of, um, you know, go out all over the world looking for corners of the globe in which to invest and, and, and find themselves um, productive uses. Um, but also, it, you know, that the rising uh, importance of those pools of capital also increases the importance of, of financial capital of the finance sector and of financial investments as opposed to investments in fixed capital so investments in kind of uh, you know factories and machinery etc as um as kind of driving forces in the capitalist system um mm. and you start seeing this you know for example with emergence of uh, of stock markets the, the rising important that has bond bond markets eventually kind of the euro dollar markets um and derivative markets and uh, securitization and the logic of financial um innovation kind of uh, accumulating as um those contradictions as you mentioned the kind of uh, declining productivity falling wages etc as they manifest themselves um and this is where this kind of links with a lot of the the more economic see literature on, on post keynesianism because um a lot of what post keynesian say about financialization can be traced back to someone called Hyman Minsky, uh, who was a kind of follower of Keynes and looked, uh, applied a lot of Keynes's ideas to um, changes that were then going on in, in the financial system. Um, and so he looked at the rise of, of securitization, which is essentially the, the transformation of um, financial claims. So, you know, uh, if I owe you something, then you have a financial claim on me, uh, the transformation of those claims into securities that can be traded on financial markets. And this was, of course, a really key process um, as mortgages were turned into securities in the run-up to the crisis. Uh, he also looked at the changing nature of the banking system, so how as um, restrictions on capital mobility were removed and as finance was deregulated, banks gained the ability to create huge amounts of uh, liquidity in the financial system, which exacerbated a lot of the uh, dynamics uh, the ups and downs of the financial cycle um, and yeah looked at the kind of role of central banks as well in, in kind of supporting that and therefore the role of the state um, and this so you know, that kind of first school is uh, the first kind of you know f talk about Hilferding, Lenin etc it's a very kind of Marxist view of it and then that gets splintered hmm. off into various different ways of looking at that as you mentioned the monthly review school um, you have various people who looked at look at this um, from a more like American imperialism perspective, so people like Leo Panitch. Um, and that, that bringing that in with the kind of post-Keynesian school adds that kind of economic perspective. And you also mentioned Krippner, who has a very interesting, uh, yeah, it's quite kind of more, uh, it's, it's very linked with the Marxist tradition, but it's more kind of political economy because it looks at financialization as a kind of mode of accumulation, as a way of kind of structuring mm. um a, a, like a, the way of structuring economic activity, uh, wherein the finance sector plays a, an increasingly important role at, at various different junctures. Um, mm. And so all of those, those things are, all of those ways of looking at financialization are important in understanding what it is, how it emerged and kind of how it's affected the economy. Um, and yeah, I, th I, don't, I, don't, I think that they're often conceived of as more clashing than they actually are in practice. So is, do you think it's appropriate to speak of financialization as sort of like a, a network or like a domain of, of various different power structures or something like that rather than like an essence? Yeah, so for, yeah, of, for me, it's, it's effectively, I mean, I, I take Krippner's view that it is uh, this new mode of accumulation, but I would argue that it, it can essentially be traced back to changing um power dynamics in uh well both the global economy and specific domestic economies that relate to underlying tendencies within 
capitalism itself so that relate to, to basically uh, the emergence of, of particular contradictions within particular uh, institutional regimes um, which are then realized in crises and which then um, lead uh, kind of adapted into new um, new modes of accumulation so that's a very abstract way of saying basically uh, the kind of finance-led growth model emerges as a response to um, the crises that go on all around the developed world in the 1970s, which themselves result from the contradictions of um, the social democratic model that was put in place after the war. Um, and that combination of the kind of changing um, nature of uh, the international system, so changes in technology, changes in governance, changes in the kind of nature of the firm, with a specific project, the neoliberal project and uh, and kind of agency in and around the state led to the emergence of this new mode of accumulation with uh, finance and financial markets at um, at its core. And that, that itself had its own contradictions. And the best way of looking at those contradictions is to read authors like Minsky, who, um, who kind of analysed those even much before, long before uh, we had the financial crisis and that that ultimately ends up um, coming to a head in, in 2007. And now we're kind of living in the long shadow of the death of the dynamism of that model without the death mm. of its kind of institutional uh, framework. Mm. We have a tendency here in the States, um, we have the among the left especially, to think about this financialization or tendency towards financialization after stagflation in the 70s and then after the last 30 years as being sort of parasitic on a more naturally mm. functioning mm. capitalism. I know like Elizabeth Warren often talks about um, financialization with that sort of uh, gloss on it. It seems like though you'd be critical of that notion, Yeah, absolutely. Right? I mean, for me, um, so I, I, I have to, I'm in two minds about this because on the one hand, you know, it's difficult not to say that finance-led capitalism is, um, you know, has particularly in states in the global north created less equal, less even um growth that has, you know, in many ways, in many senses caused a, a, a huge amount of suffering, particularly if you look at the impact it's had at, at the very bottom end of society. Although if you look at the picture globally, the story is obviously more nuanced. So it's difficult to say that, you know, um, that finance led growth is a neutral development uh, when you compare it to what came before. So the kind of Keynesian consensus. But equally, I, I don't buy this idea that it's it's this kind of it resulted from the power of financiers taking over the economy and, and like, uh, kind of corrupting capitalism almost and, and, uh, in the pursuit of their own interests. In fact, what you see is, you know, a generalized crisis of capitalism that's resolved through, um, action amongst sets of elites, which are able to kind of um, develop this new way of organizing the economy, build alliances around it, and eventually kind of institutionalize it in a, in a new um, economic framework, and who do so uh, very actively in order to not just... Um, not just to kind of benefit themselves, well, obviously, you know, primarily to benefit themselves, but also under this broader uh, idea that they're kind of, you know, saving capitalism from itself, right? Um, and so that this will actually benefit, you know, corporations, it will benefit individuals, it will uh, lead to kind of greater growth, it will bring people out of poverty. Um, all of these kind of narratives that attach to neoliberalism, which to me is the kind of um, intellectual framework that surrounds finance-led growth, which is a kind of uh, a set of power relations much as Keynesianism um, was the intellectual framework that surrounded the kind of post-war consensus. Um, so, yeah, like uh, viewing that as a, a kind of um, parasitical and uh, inversion of the true functioning of capitalism isn't quite right because it's resulted uh, from an attempt to kind of save capitalism from the contradictions of the previous model. And what has emerged has benefited all sections of capital, some sections more than others, undoubtedly, but it has benefited all sections, uh, sections of capital and has actually extended the capitalist class to include uh, many kind of middle class people in in the um, the global north as well. So uh, yeah, kind of I, I definitely don't buy this idea that finance capital is somehow parasitic on productive capital, and that um, all we need to do to to fix everything and build a perfect utopian society is somehow get rid of the the parasites and go back to a perfect productive. Um, kind of capitalist model based on the post-war consensus, not least because that was, of course, based on its own extractive form of imperialism. Hmm. 
you you uh, wrote an article for Jacobin magazine that yeah. was what was uh, what's it called? I have it right here in front of me. Uh, the that latest was called the latest incarnation. incarnation. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, and that, yeah, and that's where you kind of address some of these things. You say something in there that I was curious about. You talk about like how capitalism needs to create many capitalists and provide them with valuable capital, but when yeah. they don't have that, then it's got to find like a new way to do it. So, so if 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 financialization is a response to the crises of the late '60s and early '70s. What do you think are some of the ways that the system is now trying to, let's say, uh, equip or uh, arm people so that they can become many capitalists after the global financial collapse in 07 to 09? Are there – is like the rise of datafication and platform economies and mm-hmm. the attention economy and, and all of these uh, other service-based – sectors are those things kind of like a new type of response and that like in 20 years like the way we're talking about financialization now we'll be talking about datafication or something else Mm, like do you have any yeah very interesting question and i think you know that question of of the creation of those mini capitalists is really central to my book because it's essentially you know that property owning democracy is the political economy that underlies financialization because of course you know when you have um the financialization of the firm uh which effectively means you know uh a massive internal redistribution within firms away from workers to shareholders and the continued governance of those firms in the interests of shareholders. So uh, in order to kind of maximize dividends, maximize capital gains, uh, rather than um, provide for, you know, the needs of of stakeholders and and the wages of workers, Uh, you get obviously rising inequality um, and you get a shrinking labor share. You get much more, much higher um, gains accruing to the owners of capital than those who have to work for a living. And in and of itself, that model is, is not sustainable because you would see, you know, um, it, I mean, it, in itself, it would lead to to the tendency of the rate to profit of to fall because you would, of course, have um, workers that were unable to afford the goods the capitalists were producing, and um, therefore that kind of um, shrinking of demand that that Keynes was dealing with when he wrote about. Um, the kind of the the role of the state stepping in to um to to kind of deal with those inherent contradictions that you get as you allow capitalist production to kind of um to kind of go on on its own accord so Mm. the way that that's dealt with um is by creating a section of the population that is able to benefit from that increase in the return to ownership of, of capital relative to labor so prior to that point you know you had um uh, owners of capital, um, you had kind of middle earners and you had low earn, uh, you know, kind of um, less well off earners. And equality during the post war period, I'm talking about the UK, of course, but this is kind of generalizable vaguely to the, the US as well. Um, equality uh, during that period was um, increasing. This is the period between the end of the Second World War and the kind of 1970s. Uh, you had relatively uh, broad based growth, you had wages keeping in line with productivity. Um, and you had quite a strong trade union movement, which encompassed not mm. only working, but also middle class earners uh, kind of in kind of skilled occupations. Um, and then what you get uh, after um, the kind of finance that growth is introduced is this, um, this issue of obviously deficient demand being accounted for by turning those middle earners into mini capitalists. So that's primarily affected through the privatization of social housing stock, the deregulation of the financial system, which allows um, for the massive creation of, of mortgage debt and consumer debt on an unprecedented scale, and by the privatization of people's pension funds, um, and those being handed over to big asset managers that then invest those in um, global stock markets. And by doing that you not only push up asset prices across the board, which obviously gives a gain to elites because you're channeling tons more money into the financial system, which obviously creates inflation, but you're also extending the benefits of that asset price inflation to a much wider constituency of people, such that even if their wages aren't quite keeping pace with inflation, even if their living standards are um, not necessarily increasing as much as they did in, you know, other parts of their lives, they are increasingly delinking their sense of prosperity from wages and linking their sense of prosperity to the value of their assets, which is what allows that system to remain sustainable and secures their support for the status quo. I also just realized that I didn't answer your question about the data thing. So I'll come on to that in a sec. That's all right. Yeah, I, go, that's, that's all right. Do you, do you have thoughts on it? 
I mean, yeah, like, it's not actually something I've thought about until you mentioned it, but like that's definitely the case that, for example, uh, you know, Uber, Deliveroo, etc., all rely yeah. on you know that that technically the people that work in those companies are owners of the means of production. They own their own cars, they own their bikes, right. etc. They own the things that are being used in the production process, um, which is a kind of fascinating inversion of. Uh, the, the kind of logic about how that that's linked to prosperity. Uh, I think what you will start to see is, um, and you're seeing this now as well with kind of these apps that are coming out where you can put your savings directly into stock markets, is um, the kind of mission creep of that property owning democracy into literally everything that we own. So everything that we own becoming an asset that can in some way be used to um, engage with financial activities, whether that's borrowing against it, whether that's, um, you know, as I said, kind of it becoming uh, uh, something that you can use in the production process or whether it's kind of directly investing your money through apps. I think, you know, after that massive pool of social security capital and um, and the capital gains from property price inflation uh, has reached it, its, its peak, then you'll start to see that extending into many different other asset classes. Once organ donation becomes privatized, then we'll have yeah. uh, electrodes hooked up to our bodies that can automatically upload data You'll about be able our to organ borrow quality. Against the value of your liver. <laughs> you know, you joke. This oh, is great. fucking yeah. happening, guys. I'm fuck, I'm telling you. There was this book that I read. I don't even remember what it was called. It's called like I don't know, like Twelve Inventions of the Future or some shit like that. And this guy's talking about how, you know, basically pharmacists are going to be made obsolete because you're going to have a live-in pharmacy that you basically like stick your finger in and it's going to prick your blood and then it's going to basically do just like a little analysis of what chemicals you are either deficient in or wow. what nutrients you need and then it's going to basically create a little pill based on what's already kind of in the the stock and it's going to create a little pill and it's going to be perfectly aligned to your chemistry for that day based on what you need based on everything else and so it's going to have all those measurements and then all of that's going to be tied into some sort of centralized computer obviously and then I've, I've further heard that there's talk about basically using a system of, I don't know what you'd call it, but maybe it's like micro credits online. So right now, you know, we obviously have like free open access and you don't pay for the time that we spend on the internet, you know, like we did in the old days when AOL would give you like 1200 free hours or whatever it was, <laughs> right? But but yeah. now it's going to it's gonna go back to a system of that where you have to buy credits. You buy or you pay for the hour or you pay for the minute or something like that. And so we're basically going to be paying to go onto Amazon so that I can buy something else. And so wow. it's going to be something where they can actually monetize your attention or your time. And so I, I wonder if that's going to be a way because all of this is going to tie into big data. Mm. All of this is going to still be related to the systems and the the financial instruments that have kind of emerged in the wake of uh, the stagflation crisis uh, and the rise of financialization. So I wonder if there's going to be some sort of enfolding of financialization into datafication and we're going to get like an extraction within an extraction, you know, like a vampire sucking on – <laughs> like four layers four layers of exploitation or some shit i don't know yeah i mean I, like it's, it's a fascinating thing to a fascinating idea to contend with and i think what i the way i would view it would be that the the kind of crisis that we're the, the extended period of crisis so of stagnation um combined with um you know, so stagnant wages, stagnant productivity, uh, you know, falling profits in many places, um, low levels of corporate investment, um, that that at some point is going to have to be resolved. Uh, and looking at how that will be resolved requires looking at um, what kind of power relations prevail at the moment. And I think if you look at the kind of relative power of the big tech monopolies, then they do look like essentially what the banks look like kind of 20 years ago um so that any you know the next phase of adaption whatever kind of new mode of accumulation emerges if um that is in the hands of capital rather than labor will definitely be determined to a, a huge extent by uh the interests of those tech companies what's interesting now is that you're starting to see i, I, I mean and, and this is kind of the, the thrust of my book is that, that we're living in this moment before this Gram gramscian interregnum it's said so many times but it you know it's it's worth repeating between the death of that old mode of accumulation the emergence of something new now it is completely um you know imaginable that 
capital will take the initiative as it did in the 80s and as it has done so frequently before and envision a new, even more extractive way to maximise profits, even in the context of kind of uh, escalating contradictions of of, um, the capitalist model. But equally, you know, we're at a point in time where um, Labour, particularly in the global north, has a great deal of power to be able to start shifting that. And you are starting to see that with the kind of backlash against the big tech companies um, and, you know, the way in which many governments are now starting to, you know, look at India, for example, saying that Amazon can't be both a, a producer and a marketplace. It's quite an interesting example of that. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not going to be, uh, it's definitely going to be a continued source of of struggle and who ends up winning out on that will be determined over what happens over the next couple of years but um you know whilst i'm not completely and utterly pessimistic that the tech companies will take over the world i'm also definitely not complacent about that potentially (laughs) happening either i'm trying to get troy to watch the Firefest documentary (gasps) oh my god it's so good bruh (laughs) i told you we're gonna do we're we're gonna gotta do an episode on this because i'm thinking like that's basically about like instagram come to life which is the attention economy cultural capital sign value and everyone's a brand on instagram right like you take a photo and your identity is your brand and if you have enough followers then you can monetize that because you can get a sponsorship for i don't know look at my new protein shake that i'm using while i blast my ass at the gym or something like that because i'm an influencer and so like the means of production is your vitality as a human being or your beauty or your six pack or whatever it is that you can use that has cultural capital. And so I kind of, it feels like at least that aspect of, uh, of like socioeconomic modalities is starting to kind of have more of a prominent place than before because it's, it's democratized. Well, quote unquote, in the sense that it's anybody can be an exploited brand under capitalism, which Mm. isn't true democracy, I guess we would say. But I kind of wonder if that's kind of it, you know? Like we're all just going to be these fucking simulacra. I I know you you did like philosophy and shit in your undergrad degree. So like this (laughs) postmodern Baudrillard, like I don't know, we're just going to – something like that. that. I vaguely remember reading the impenetrable French – philosophers um (laughs) yeah like it's again you know my my relationship to this question is because when you look at the underlying trends and when you look at the tendencies within capitalism especially over the course of the 20th century if you look at you know uh how after the war capital emerges on the back foot labor on the front foot managers create these keynesian institutions that for a while contain the the kind of darkest most extractive elements of of this system and how immediately capital sets about attempting to undermine those whether it's through you know creating Mont Pelerin or whether it's through the euro dollar markets or undermining capital ability creating these huge multinational corporations with the help of the american state um and you know obviously that is a process that began kind of in the 50s and ultimately uh, exploded when the opportunity arose because of the breakdown of the previous system in in, in the 70s and, and created this new extra hyper extractive financialized mode. Um, and, and so that kind of tendency for capitalism to push and strain against the restrictions that are imposed on it like does imply that it will seep ever deeper into every aspect of our lives until, you know, there is literally nothing left. But I'm also, yeah, as I said, I'm kind of ambivalent about that because, you know, the, as another French philosopher said, the exercise of power creates resistance. And, you know, I do think that we are getting to that particular that phase where, you know, people are, the scales have been pulled from many people's eyes and more and more people are starting to see the real extractive, exploitative power relations that exist at the heart of this system every single day. And we are starting to organize to resist that. And I don't know, you know, obviously I'm kind of vaguely familiar with the States. I don't know what it's like in Australia, but certainly in the UK now, on the left, it feels like we are at a moment of, of real opportunity. I don't want to be pollyanna and say that, you know, we're close to getting rid of capitalism, but we're certainly at what feels like an inflection point. And I think that if left movements around the world can take advantage of this, then we don't have to envisage these horrific, you know, uh, dystopian Mad Max style scenarios hmm. as to what will happen to us, um, you know, over the course of the next several decades of capital kind of sucking our blood and the earth exploding 
But, you know, also it could happen the other way. It's all very contingent. Yeah, my, my pessimistic side wonders if the specter hanging over all this is climate change mm. and that if we had a, a long-term ability to sort of figure these things out and increase labor power um, over this long term, then then maybe we could be a little bit more optimistic about our prospects. But we have this specter hanging over the whole thing, which is this limited time we have before disaster can strike. Um, and that seems to maybe put a little bit of a limit on the optimism. I know what not? you mean, but I also kind of see the climate imperative as an opportunity because when you know throughout history you would say capitalism has its contradictions things are going to only get worse if we allow it to continue um and people would shout back no it's not you know it's reduced poverty everyone's going to get better off the the sky's the limit you know we're gonna pull pull all the rest of the world up to the west standard living and spread you know free market democracy and everything's going to be wonderful and beautiful and, you know, now people still do respond like that. But you say, yeah, but climate change, if we don't completely and utterly change the way our economy works within the next decade, then we're literally screwed. And it does kind of bring people together around the idea that there is a very strong need for extremely radical thinking. And I think especially when you look at things like, you know, what's happening at the moment with the Green New Deal, that's a massive opportunity that may not otherwise be there were it not for the climate imperative. So yeah, on the one hand, you know, it's terrifying, it's a spectre hanging over us, and it's the type of thing that makes you feel deeply impotent and terrified. But it's also bringing together a larger constituency, perhaps, than we otherwise might have, and therefore kind of potentially increasing the opportunities for change. Hey, Troy, that's... Gia Cohen says that, remember? In in the book that we just finished. Said what? About how, how like, ecological disaster would be a way to sort of bring together these various exploited persons, the very needy, and then the kind of the typical industrial proletariat mm. from around the globe. I don't want to um, sound like an oh, accelerationist, yeah. by the way, because that's not, not what I'm saying, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I kind of agree. <laughs> yeah, that does make sense. I mean, you think about the, the original New Deal as only being possible via the coalition formed after the Great Depression. Mm. Um, the Green New Deal would certainly have its prospects in that same in that same way, right? The coalition that can be formed around um, e- ecological interests as well as you know interests around the welfare state and things like mm. that, and social democracy. Yeah, no, mm. that's true. Well, do you? There's a lot of debate though about whether or not you can have green growth in the economic mm. community. So you have people like Herman Daly, who's you know a steady state economist. And he kind of argues that uh, entropy is sort of just a fact of life and we can't war against entropy. So we have Mm. to decelerate our productive capacities um, because it's inevitable, right? Like we just simply do not have the resources. We have a a finite supply of resources that is fixed. And but then you have other people that are like, no, like, you know, this Green New Deal, you can have productive investment. Now, it's based a lot on like MMT and modern monetary yeah. theory and this idea that like governments can just run these huge deficits. And one of the guys that works here in the department, his name's Mike Beggs. I don't know if you're yeah. familiar with his work, but yeah. he's been tweeting vociferously against this uh, recently. And it's been great um, to kind of see his criticism because there's a lot of really interesting debate going on, at least in the in the Twitter sphere and other social media landscapes about this. And what do you think? Like, is the green, can you have green growth? Is the green new deal, is it even formulated the right way? Like, like Troy was just saying, like, does it have, like, how does it to fit into, I mean, obviously it's taking the name new deal from the old new deal. Mm. Like how, how does it kind of fit within this, uh, like larger economic theoretical framework and is it going to work? So there are a couple of different issues here. And if I'm going to try and keep to these issues rather than go off on a tangent on each one of them. But firstly, that, that, <laughs> that question about the links between the Green New Deal and the actual New Deal are fascinating because, um, think about the new, I mean, we've got to conceive of the New Deal. We want to conceive of everything that happened in that post-war period as intimately linked to a very particular form of growth premised upon Western imperialism, an actual colonialism and imperialism as well as you know uh, uh, the kind of imperialism that the, the United States has continues to undertake to this day um, and so you know that, that was at that moment that capitalism did have so much space into which to expand um, it had just finished expanding you know throughout the entire of North America and you know was about to kind of go off um, and create this new wave of development in China various other places around the world 
Um, and those kind of, you know, open, open spaces um, that capitalism requires to, to work were, did, did definitely still exist and were, you know, still being exploited by um, the core countries. And that was a really critical part of everything that was going on during that time of that, of that particular era. And then, of course, there was, it was also patriarchal capitalism. So it was, you know, employment for um, men with women not being particularly involved in the labour force. Um, so, you know, that is a, a, a very good point to make because a lot of the kind of criticism mm. of, um, especially MMT today, is that um, when it's done in an unsophisticated way, firstly, it denies the existence of any resource constraints. And secondly, it is based on American exceptionalism. Because, of course, one of the things that's required... It, it, one of the main reasons that MMT would work so well in the States is that, you know, the dollar is the global reserve currency and everyone's going to need dollars. It's the same reason that America can run huge deficits without ever it having it re- really having its credit rating impacted because everyone needs dollars. Everyone needs U.S. assets to invest in, which gives them mm. a huge amount more freedom. But that's not an option that's available to, you know, Burkina Faso, for example, like just completely and utterly off, off the table. Um, actually, I don't know if Burkina Faso uses the dollar, but, you know, whatever like countries either with their own currencies or which um use the dollar or another currency over which they don't have any control um mm. and then there's the other question about you know un- unsophisticated mmt basically says there's no resource constraints we don't need to tax the wealthy we don't you know we need to tax the wealthy better the government can just kind of print an endless amount of money and everything will be fine of course you know there are obvious real resource constraints um and uh, you know, MMT, like any other policy instrument, needs to be would need to be used. Well, money creation, like any other policy instrument, would need to be used with a view to um, promoting a balance between inflation and employment. Because you know, creating huge amounts of money without a corresponding increase in, in capacity um, would just simply be inflationary. So that you know, it's not that it's not the case that MMT means you can just print limitless amounts of money. Uh, it's that you know there isn't a um, very hard and tight limit on the amount that can be borrowed or printed in order to finance stuff that's going to expand um, the size of the economy over the longer term. Whether that's you know investment in roads and bridges or human capital, whether it's educating people or or you know research and development or whatever else. Um, but on that kind of final question of, of what green growth, of whether or not green growth is possible, I think it is, but I think we need to be careful what we're measuring. Because if you're talking about is green GDP growth possible, then no, I don't think it is. But GDP is the, the most deeply flawed measure of uh, prosperity that we could possibly hope to have. Um, and of course, you know, if you start if you completely transform the way we measure growth and include in it uh, considerations about the degradation of the environment as well as, you know, inequality um, and various other, you know, financial stability, various other metrics, then you start to get a much more, um, you know, nuanced perspective as to how the economy is doing. Uh, And, you know, generally there would be a happy medium whereby you could, you know, find an equilibrium point between expanding, you know, expanding prosperity, expanding the, um, the productivity of the, the fixed resources that we do have, whether that's through technological change or, you know, educating the workforce or whatever, um, and also maintaining and, and protecting our environment. Hmm. Troy, did you read the frequent, not the frequently asked questions, but like the bullet points that were just released, uh, and then I guess taken down from, uh, I think it was on AOC's website. Did you see that? Yeah, I briefly uh, produced that. Yeah. Do yesterday. you think that America even has like the political will? I mean, it's amazing that like I think like five of the leading Democratic candidates for president in 2020 have all signed on in support of it, despite what Nancy Pelosi just recently smeared the other day. Like, but do you think that, that there's really the political will for something like that in America, Troy? I don't know. I, it's really kind of surprising me how quickly someone like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has gained prominence and then sort of taken control of a political narrative amongst like a huge swath of the country. It's really surprising and, and really makes me unprepared or feel unprepared for how the Overton window is going to be changed over the next couple of years. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine anything like Medicare for all being a bullet point on every single uh, Democratic nominee's <laughs> right? like front page. A couple of years ago, yeah, right? that you just never would have thought about that. I mean, the whole point of Obamacare was, you know, 
even the most optimistic person was thinking, well, Obamacare is going to maybe 10, 15, 20 years down the road, it'll be the step towards Medicare for all. That was the most optimistic take, right? And now we're at the next election cycle after Obama left, and it's already looking like it's going to be the like well, the big, um, the big issue that all the Democratic nominees are going to fight over. Yeah. So I don't know about anybody else, but I feel like everything is a bit open. And you know, Grace, you were talking about this before in terms of um, crisis can sometimes beget opportunity in this way, and maybe that's an example of it as well. Yeah, totally. Well, that's the title. That's the title of what Philip Murawski's book. Yeah. What is it? Never let a serious, serious crisis, crisis go, go to waste. waste. And that's. Yeah. And then, and then I don't know if you know this, Grace, but I'm actually producing the documentary adaptation of Inventing the Future: Post Capitalism <gasps> oh in God, a World Without Work. That yeah. So, so cool. and that. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that obviously Nick and Alex talk about yeah. in their book is this idea that we can build counter hegemonic strategies now, like Mont Pelerin of the left. You know, yeah. where we're preparing now so that. That when the opportunity is there, we're ready to fucking strike. And part of me is like, ooh, that's very romantic and let's fucking do it. Because, you know, I'm an existentialist and I'm yeah. like, let's fucking take control of our destiny. But then another part of me is like, is that how it works, though? You know, like, well, or does it need to be some sort of like incrementalism? You do which I know people hate be... on the Marxist left, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. you do not have to be a, an existentialist to kind of view this as a, a moment of real opportunity. Um, you can be a structuralist and, and actually say that we should be preparing now. Because I think, um, you know, mm. what... Uh, you know, an unsophisticated reading of historical materialism says that capitalism just has its own inherent contradictions. You let that happen and it just destroys itself. But sophisticated right. reasoning is that Marx... You know, as you know, he read everything dialectically and he was aware that there was a dialectic between structures and agency and that, you know, that was realized during moments of crisis. Crises are moments when institu the institutional settlements that govern capitalism, because capitalism cannot function without state institutions and, and social institutions and various other institutions, when those institutions break down as a result of the inherent crisis tendencies within that economic system. And when those institutions can no longer contain the like dynamic uh, and also destructive energy of capitalism and they break it creates these extended moments of crises and because they these crises are are institutional breakdown they are also moments when contingency becomes huge because of course what are institutions they are mechanisms to contain people's behavior you know it, it, under the normal functioning of society when those are gone you are suddenly, you know, facing these moments of radical contingency where, you know, it feels like anything can happen. And I think we're in one of those moments now. And I, I think that's why everything looks so crazy to people, why politics looks so crazy, why kind of economics looks so crazy, why so many, you know, insane things are happening. Um, so I mm. think, and that is, that is a historically bounded moment because at some point one force will emerge powerful enough to institutionalize its own settlement. But it is simultaneously true to say that we are, we could not do what we we could not have done what we are doing now before the financial crisis that we would have been laughed at and that none of these ideas you know would have mattered and the organizing whilst helpful for keeping the movement together would not have created any big steps and that now you know we're in this moment of radical contingency where anything could happen yeah like Troy, do you remember when Slavoj Žižek said that he wanted Trump to win because it would galvanize the left? <laughs> <laughs> and ev and everyone are you, are you saying he was right? <laughs> and ever yeah, and everyone and everyone flipped their shit and they were like, "He's a Trump supporter. He's supporting a fascist white supremacist." And now everyone is kind of like, "Well, this if Hillary Clinton had won and the status the neoliberal center left status quo or extreme center as Tariqa Lee says right we're in power in the United States would there be as much momentum but no you have this kind of Bernie populist movement you have the Corbyn populist movement you don't really have anything going on in Australia um uh, that's well you guys are still noteworthy. you haven't had your crash yet yeah that exactly yeah, yeah. well uh and we just had Joseph Stig yeah Joseph Stiglitz was out here. He was accepting a peace prize in Sydney. And uh, basically, he was like, you guys are just 20 years behind the United yeah. States. <laughs> and just like the whole rest of the, you know, like the US and the UK were 20 years behind Japan. Okay, yeah. Because, you know, the devil so, was in Japan in the 90s, then it burst here in 2007. And oh, that's you guys, right. When the slowdown happens in China, um, or, or, you know, the bubble bursts in China, then you and, and New Zealand are going to be next. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Yeah, so Japan, they're lost, what was it, the lost generation yeah, or whatever yeah, in, the yeah, the in the 90s? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. 
And then so the United States is a decade or so behind. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but it's crazy, right, Troy, that like, you know, you don't want to be a consequentialist, but like maybe Zizek was onto something there, you know? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to say hashtag Zizek was right. Maybe like he could have been, he, or he might have been right. Or he will have been right. He will have, might have if been right. If he was yeah. even a little bit right, he was deliberately right in the most obnoxious way that he conceivably could have been, yeah. as he always is. Well, that's just Zizek's brand, yeah. Yeah. Um, but also, we have to say, as much as crisis begets opportunity, it begets opportunity for more than just the left and Absolutely. labor. It also yeah. begets opportunity for owners of capital, and they're well aware that the movement of you know the Bernie, the Bernie Kratz and, and democratic socialism in America is growing, and they know that that's the one force that can take power from them, that's willing to take power from them, and they're opposed to that in every possible way. I think it was Bhaskar Sankara over at Jacobin who was. Um, tweeting uh, recently about how um, I can't remember which industry it was, but uh, was basically saying they they're fine with uh, Cory Booker and Kamala Harris and even Elizabeth Warren. Yeah. The one person that they will absolutely say no to in every way is Bernie, and so yeah. they're fully aware um, of the contingency here as well. Hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I completely agree, and like so much of what. Because, I mean, you know, we say it's it's radically contingent and it is more contingent than usual. But, uh, I mean, in many ways during these moments, what matters, you know, institutions don't matter as much. Uh, so those kind of mechanisms for constraining behavior. But what does matter is the balance of power. And just because one side hasn't conclusively won out yet doesn't mean that capital is still not does not hold most of the cards because it absolutely does you know if you look at the structure of the global economy if you look at um the, you know the ease with which investors are able to move their money around the world if you look at the number of states that they are in control of if you look at um you know the way that the entire international financial system works it's all governed in the interests of of capital and so we absolutely you know just these small windows of opportunity in democratic states where there happens to be a large um and like well-developed working class combined with a middle class that is now getting worse off and therefore those kind of ripe revolutionary conditions do exist you know those are very small um windows and so you have to kind of have some sort of vague faith in the idea that you know Mm. The, that somehow maybe uh, there's like some, some good forces operating in history as well as just awful ones to believe that anything good is going to come out of this. Uh, you have to have some blind optimism. Because, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just as likely that we'll get, get to the end of this crisis moment. We will have this horrifying um, tech company run surveillance capitalism super extractive everyone's like a basically working like a machine in an amazon factory and the planet's also destroyed you know there's this that is a a possible outcome as well well that's depressing as fuck thanks i know but we can't believe that we We have to believe that you know there are goodies and that you know they have a chance (laughs) yeah blade runner was much better as a movie than as reality yeah fucking hey right (laughs) it was jesus (laughs) <laughs> okay. Well, look, Grace. I know you gotta you gotta get running. Um, so we'll let you go. Um, cool. Real quick, before you head out, where can people find you on the internet? And tell us about your book, where, where, and when they can get it. Good questions. So I am on Twitter at Grace Blakely. That's B L A K E L E Y two E's. Um, and my book will be out in September, uh, I think, if I manage to finish the the second draft. So you know send mm-hmm. positive vibes um and that's with repeater books uh yeah so thanks so much for having me on the podcast guys it was really good fun yeah not a problem yeah thanks that was fantastic thank you so much grace um and also uh you how often do you write for a new statesman is it once a week every week every week yeah so every week something comes out cool so yeah. people can check that out as well you just did a new one uh recently on like the lucas plan right yeah i sure did okay <laughs> Cool. Yeah, people run over to New Statesman, check it out. You just started this maybe like a month and a half, two months ago or something like that, right? So you yeah, got exactly. Yeah, the beginning of the year, yeah. A handful of back catalog and more moving forward. So cool. Well, exactly. sit, Grace. We'll get out of here. Go do what you got to do, and uh, and we'll be in touch. Cool. Thanks so much for having me, guys. It was great to speak to you. All right, sweet. Well, uh, again, want to thank Grace so much for coming on for that amazing conversation. I feel like she threw so much fucking information out. 
that I gotta listen to this again. I don't even listen to our episodes again, because, you know, like, it's like the actor, you know, you don't watch yourself on screen. I mean, unless you're trying to critique yourself, but I don't listen to the podcasts. So, but I'm gonna go back and listen to this because there was so much stuff going on there. And I'm really, I'm really thinking through like the Green New Deal stuff. And I don't really know how I come down on all of this because there's some really interesting stuff that was in there. But then, as I mentioned, the guy Mike Beggs, who is a political economist here in Sydney, he's been quite critical of the way that it's been structured in the framework of modern monetary theory. And so I'm really curious. I'm thinking through this and how can we, how can we mitigate some of the problems of climate and and so I just it, there was so much stuff there. I'm super fascinated by it. Yeah, 100. percent I think the Green New Deal stuff is something I'm also um, have strong mixed feelings about. So gonna have to mm. think over that stuff for quite a while. Sweet, sweet, sweet. I didn't even think the conversation was gonna go there. It was just like some some spontaneous shit. All right, though. The next thing we got to do is we got to get into the segment of our podcast that brings joy to our lives. It's where we talk about something that is giving us meaning in a world that is often devoid of meaning. It's called The Sticky Leaves. You know, it's from that obscure Russian novel. Well, I guess it's not obscure. so obscure because it's one of the most <laughs> famous novels. It's one of the most famous novels ever written, <laughs> Brothers Karamazov, <laughs> where uh, you tell the story, Troy. What is it? Ivan and Ilya? What is it? Yeah, Ivan and, Il- and Ilyo- Alyosha, excuse me, and Miksha, the three Alyosha, brothers. Yeah. yeah, and they're talking about religion, God, politics, revolution, all that shit for like 800 pages. It's wonderful. <laughs> and there's a point where you know the one guy doesn't believe in god and the brother turns to him and says well if you don't believe in god what is it that gives you meaning and he talks about how it's the sticky leaves on a sunday morning or whatever as you're walking and it's about embracing life and shit like that so this is our sticky leaves troy what's giving you meaning this week so i read this article this week um from of all places gq which is i guess now Ooh. the like a uh, source for um awesome cultural leftist uh, material these days you're gonna and, start uh, waxing is that what you're saying nah dude the brazilian start waxing nazis though because <laughs> this, this is my segue because the article is titled Ooh. nazi punks fuck off how black flag bad brains and more took back their scene from white supremacists an article by steve oh. and nopper and um it's an oral history of uh hardcore and post-hardcore bands and how they fought off uh, the basically the invasion of uh, Nazi skinheads in the 80s into their scene. I think anyone who knows a little bit about um, 80s hardcore mm-hmm. in America knows about Nazi skinheads and stuff like that, even though, got to be careful, not all skinheads are Nazis, but um, there are Nazi skinheads. And uh, mm-hmm. if you've watched the movie Green Room um, that came out a couple of years ago, it was my movie of the year a couple of years ago. It's a fantastic film about mm. a uh, punk band that goes and accidentally plays a like Nazi stronghold or Nazi venue that's a uh, stronghold for white supremacists. And they play the famous Dead Kennedy song, Nazi Punks Fuck Off, which was a terrible decision. Mm-hmm. And then everybody dies. Um, yes. Yeah. So I think everyone's kind of at least vaguely familiar with that whole thing. But, uh, and, I, and I've known a lot about it from, from reading about it in the you know, 80s. Um, Post hardcore and stuff is something that I'm really versed in from my youth. But the interesting thing about this article is it's not just like a like a rote Wikipedia um, styled entry on um, Nazi skinheads in the 80s. It's an oral history from members of the bands themselves, uh, how they personally dealt with uh, these issues. And so there's um, Henry Rollins, famously, you know, of Black Flag and the Rollins Band. Everyone knows about Henry Rollins. He has a, a number of um, paragraphs in this article, which are wonderful. Um, Mike Watt from the Minutemen is in it. Uh, drummer from Swans is in it. Um, let's see who else. Uh, the lead singer from Dirty Rotten Imbeciles is in it. Uh, Keith Morris from the Circle Jerks and also from Black Flag. A number of uh, well-known people in the hardcore scene. Um, just talking about telling different stories about how they had to deal with uh, Nazi skinheads in the 80s trying to infiltrate um, hardcore shows. And um, oh, also Daryl Jennifer from Bad Brains. If you know, Bad Brains was the all black uh, kind of Rastafarian hardcore band. Um, hmm. And he talks a little bit about some of the experiences he had, which were pretty funny. And there's one thing, especially that Henry Rollins mentions near the end of the article that I thought was worth repeating on the sticky leaves here because it kind of made my day reading this. Uh, Henry Rollins says, um, he was asked whether or not 
he thinks it's okay to punch Nazis, the classic question everyone's asked, right? Uh -huh. And he says, you know, from his experience, he says, when I was able to get the audience to turn on them, the Nazis, it was interesting to often see how upset that made them, speaking of the Nazis, that they had no idea how much people actually hated them. I found this approach to be mm -hmm. effective. It's not for me to instruct someone to go hit someone else. But if I can say something that makes everyone laugh at these guys, it empowers the right people and diminishes the right people. And I thought that was really great um, in terms of something we talked about on the episode we did way back in the day about whether it's okay to punch Nazis. And the idea being that it's the wrong question, right? The idea is not about whether you should punch Nazis, but to sort of take power away from them is the key because a Nazi is someone who is trying to use words and debates in a, as a subterfuge sort of for gaining power over others and excluding people, right? And so disempowering them is the key. And um, I thought Rollins really got to the heart of that issue um, and sort of taking away the mystique of this incredible power that these people are supposed to have when really they're just weaklings when it comes down to it. Um, so I'd encourage anybody mm. to go and uh, check out this article. Again, it's called Nazi Punks Fuck Off, which is the famous Dead Kennedy song. Um, and uh, get a little of an uplift from these stories about uh, how everything exists in cycles and Nazis invading anime circles is not an entirely new thing in culture. Same thing happened in hardcore. Whoa, in the 80s. is this a thing? What? That Nazis are invading anime? You don't know about anime Nazis? No, dude. Oh, uh, dude, you need to go and Google some shit right now. No, I don't. I really don't. Got to self care, man. <laughs> Got to. <laughs> yeah, second thought, oh, don't. Gosh, <laughs> you're not gonna gain gosh. anything. You realize I'm going to now. Yeah, you're gonna like, have to. How, how <laughs> could you not? To. How could I not? Now I'm so curious. Oh man, no, that's cool, man. Like, but GQ always kind of has been known. You read it for the articles, bro. Like, but no, really though, haven't haven't they kind of always had good staff writers? Oh, or no? oh yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I I follow them on Twitter and. Like, it's not just, you know, Daniel Craig looking sexy or something like that. Like, a lot of times they have really provocative articles. And they're not always, like, they're not always the most uh, deep or kind of, like, analytical pieces. But a lot of times they can be thought-provoking, um, which I would have never thought of unless – this is one of the good things about social media because I would have never known that were it not for Twitter. But I don't even remember why I started following them. It was probably because of some bullshit like male dude beauty thing. And then now I was like, oh, fuck it. They actually – I actually do read it for the articles now. <laughs> yeah, the page you know? 12 stuff um, you have equal access to now that you're on Twitter. So that's one good thing. It's not just Ryan yeah. Gosling with his 5 o'clock shadow. Which I'm down with too. I mean, whatever, man. <laughs> you know. He's a beautiful man. Um, well, sweet. Okay. So uh, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up the episode there. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode. If you want to stay updated with what we've got going on, we try to be as active as possible with our busy schedules on social media. But you can hit us up on Twitter, owls underscore at underscore dawn. We, also, we actually do have an Instagram page. And I'm going to try to be as – I'm trying to do my own personal Instagram page. And I'm going to try to do the Owls at Dawn Instagram page. So you can check us out on Instagram as well. Um, and then we have a Facebook page. Oh, I didn't even say what our Instagram handle was. Uh, so our Instagram handle is the same as Twitter, Owls underscore at underscore Dawn. You can hit us up on Facebook as well. We have a Facebook page. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash Owls at Dawn so you can see how you can get access to our bonus content. Uh, what else, Troy? Uh, you can hit us on our website, owlsatdawn.com, if you want to leave comments for the episode. Uh, or email us at owlsatdawnpodcast at gmail.com. Sweet. And I think that's pretty much it, man, right? Is there anything else we got to do? Just one more thing, dude. What's that? Das Vidania Amerikanski. Yeah, yeah.